rock and my redeemer. Amen. So what do you think of when you hear the word faith? What are the qualities that you say are connected with faith? Think about something strong that's something unwavering, maybe. Something firm, certain, unshakable, maybe. That's often what's thought of as the ideal, right? What we think of as the ideal. Faith is strong, it's unshakable. Is that really the ideal or is that really the goal of faith? Faith and certainty, or a certainty of faith, seem like a popular notion. That people are certain of their understanding, or certain of their belief, and certain of their opinion. But the problem with certainty is that it tends to shut down the conversation. It tends to shut down the pursuit of more knowledge, or more understanding. It can even create a sense of arrogance in oneself. And I think there's a good deal of confusion about faith in our culture. Because when someone says, I have faith, they often mean I'm right, <laughs> right? I, I know what I believe, and I have it right, by the way. I have it correct. And it can mean sometimes that it makes me better than you because I have faith, and I am different than you, and I'm saved, and I'm a separate class of people. So I'm correct and superior to other people. And that's not a good attitude to have, is it, Right? It's better to be in process. It's better to be in a state of humility, a state of I am in learning, I'm in process. So it's not so much what we know about the things of faith, too. It's about what is our attitude toward them. But most importantly, not only that, is what are, are we living by the things that we believe to be true? There's a chapter in the True Christian Religion that says that it's essential, the essential, it's essential that faith and charity must be together. You can't have charity by itself. You can't have faith by itself. Either of them are weak or they don't work. They have to be together. So you only have as much faith as you have charity or life. And also the recognition that all of that is something we get from the Lord. Here's a passage that says, Genuine, genuine wisdom consists in our seeing from the light of heaven that the things which we know, understand, are in, and are wise in are so little respectively to what we do not know, understand and are wise in, as a drop of water compared to the ocean, consequently scarcely anything. So wisdom is recognition that I don't know anything. <laughs> compared to what I know and what I have faith in, what I believe in is like a drop of water compared to the ocean. So it's hard to see certainty in that statement, isn't it? You see a lot of statement in someone whose faith is like a drop of water compared to a whole ocean. No, it seems kind of small. So here's a story about doubting Thomas, so-called. He's been labeled that. That's not what it says in the story. But Thomas, one of the disciples, did not believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. He said, I'm not going to believe it unless I can see him for myself, unless I can put my hand, fingers into the nail prints in his hands and into his side. So all the disciples except Thomas saw the Lord, and they believed it because they saw it, but Thomas didn't. But eventually he does. He eventually does see the Lord eight days later, and the Lord says to him, because you have seen me, you believe. Blessed are those, those who have not seen, yet have believed. So we're left with this iconic story, a doubting Thomas, which I think people would use as an insult, right? They called you a doubting Thomas. You wouldn't say, well, that's, thank you. That's nice, <laughs> right? We say, oh, what is it about me that you consider to be weak? What is my faith? My faith is, my faith is weak. But if you do have doubts, if you do have doubts about faith, about God, is that okay? I would say absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. The fact that you do have doubts is probably a good thing because it means you're questioning what you're hearing. You're wondering about it. You don't just sort of discard it or accept it blindly and say, oh yeah, absolutely. The path to belief and faith includes doubt. In fact, that's part of the journey. That's normal. It's even preferred in heaven, when people are taught in heaven, they are given a truth, and then immediately after that truth, they're given something that causes them to doubt what they just learned so that they will think about it more deeply and rationally understand it. Here's where it says that. It says, as soon as in the other life any truth is presented before good spirits, 
by a manifest experience, there is soon afterward presented something opposite, which causes doubt. In this way, it has given them to think about it and to consider whether it be so, and to collect reasons, and thus to bring that truth into their minds rationally. The Lord wants us to understand truth in a rational manner. He doesn't want us to blindly believe without really understanding. He wants us to know why we believe what we believe. And how is that possible? How does it work, right? So it's okay. It's good to have doubt. It's good to have healthy doubt. To think about something, to consider it, to think about the rational causes for it so that it becomes firmly implanted in our mind freely. So why do I stand here before you and ask you to believe in things you can't see? Right? I'm like, hey, you should believe in God. Or you should believe in life after death. How about angels? Think about that. And I think the reason is, the bottom line here is that when we can believe in those things, we can be happy, but we shouldn't bypass our reason in order to understand them. So I don't want you to believe in something just because I said so. That would be, don't do that. <laughs> because, because Dave said so, no. Do it because it makes sense to you, because the Lord has said so. Maybe you've looked into it more, but not because some pastor has told you to do it. Belief should not be compelled by somebody else. That Lord actually says that's hurtful to your, your faith to have someone compel you to believe something. So I think it's belief is a huge thing. What we believe matters a lot. Why? Because when we believe something, we behave differently because of it. If it doesn't cause us to act differently, then we probably really don't believe it. If you believe exercise is really good for you, but you never do it, I'd say, well, I don't think you really believe that. <laughs> right? That's that kind of a thing. Or if you believe that having a healthy diet is good for you, and you don't work on that, then it's like, well, you don't really believe it. Something's missing there. Right? Something isn't working. So in the arena of spiritual life and spiritual growth, it's a big thing to believe in something because when you believe in something, again, you act differently because of it. If you believe you should love your neighbor as yourself, then you work on that. If you don't, then you just treat everyone badly. You don't care. So doubt is fine, but an attitude has a lot to do with it. And that's what this, these passages well, we brought forward today talk about is that our attitude towards truth or attitude towards belief has a lot to do with that. So it's not whether you're doubting, it's how you're doubting that makes a difference. So what I'm going to ask, invite you to do today is think about your attitude towards truth or attitude towards doubting. Because I think what we believe tends to be what we want to believe. If you really want to believe in God, for example, I think you will believe in God. If you really don't want to, then you probably won't. But if you're open to the possibility and seeking out information with a positive attitude, that's very different than saying, oh, there's no God, and anything you tell me, I'm just going to shut it down. It doesn't make any sense. So what kind of attitude do we bring forward? That story of the rich man and Lazarus was a good example of somebody who he wants to believe, you know, he ends up in the other world, and he's tormented. He's like, well, send somebody to my family, and that will convince them. And he's like, well, if they don't believe in what Moses says, if they don't believe in the word, they don't believe what the teachings are, it's not going to make any difference to them whether someone shows up from the dead and says, hey, believe in life after death. It matters what our attitude toward it is. So in that example of Lazarus and Abraham, the example is, let me read it to you. It says, he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. So this in, in this example, it's the evidence isn't going to make the difference. It's going to be something else. Do I want to believe that? It's interesting, as a pastor, sometimes people come up to me and say, will you come talk to my friend or my family member because they're an atheist or whatever, and can you, like, will you convince them that there's a God? Will you convince them that life's after death and that there's a life after death and that kind of thing? My response to that is, well, look, we all have the same evidence. We're all looking at the same stuff. If they want to believe it, they probably will. If they don't, it doesn't matter what I say. It's not going to make any difference to them. It's about what attitude are they bringing to the conversation. I mean, I'm happy to talk to them, but my experience is 
You don't want to. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever. So what is our attitude towards faith? What is our attitude towards belief is the question. Now, the New Church teachings, I'm sure you heard it because it talked about stupidity and insanity. It's like, oh, what's he talking about? <laughs> right? There's two principles or two attitudes of mind. There's affirmative and negative principles or affirmative and negative attitudes. It says one leads to all folly and insanity or utter stupidity and insanity. So we don't want that one, right? The other leads to all wisdom and intelligence and understanding. And the negative attitude is this. I won't believe it until it is shown to me. I need evidence. I need you to prove it to me. And the problem with that is we will always not believe. Or we will never believe because we'll always come up with some reason why we don't want to believe that, why it's not true. The writings say this. People like that deny all things or say in the heart that we cannot believe them until we are convinced what we, by what we can apprehend or perceive by our senses. We need to be able to touch it, see it, taste it, know that it's true. The positive attitude, on the other hand, means we go after it with an attitude that is open. We say, I don't understand it. I may not understand it yet or perceive it yet, but I believe it's possible. I believe it's true because the Lord has said so. And it's interesting, too, that we're told, now maybe you're somebody who's waiting for a miracle, right? Like, show me a miracle, God, and I will be right there. I'll, I'll sign on the dotted line. The Lord says, we're not taught by miracles anymore because it shuts down our understanding. It compels a belief. The children of Israel back in the day depended upon miracles. They had many occasions to see God's power, and they saw victory over their enemies because of God's power. So they believed because of that. Like the plagues that were sent to free them out of Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, fire on Mount Sinai when the Ten Commandments were given, water from the rock man in the wilderness. All these things were examples of miracles that compelled them to trust in God. But you'll notice if you follow their story, as soon as those disappeared, they were back at it and didn't believe anything. <laughs> it's like it lasted for the miracle and then it went away. And you see it also when Jesus was on earth and how he was preaching and healing and raising people from the dead, feeding 5,000 and so forth. People believed him as long as they saw the miracle. But you remember what happened on Good Friday? It's like, crucify him. They turned, from, turned against him. When the outward sign is removed, the belief stops. That's the problem of the miracle. Do you ever do this? I do this quite often. It's like, if I'm thinking about a decision, it's like, all right, Lord, if you really want this to happen, then I will win this solitaire game. Or if you want this to happen, then all the lights will turn green. And it's like, and then if it doesn't turn green, they're like, well, let me think of a different question <laughs> or a different way I can get my sign that I'm looking for. You know, it's weak. It's obviously a weak way to, to base your faith, right? Because it's not founded on the truth. It's not founded on trusting in the Lord. The same thing is true when we are in a state of sickness. The Lord says we're not reformed in a state of sickness because we're in a desperate state and we believe in the Lord because we feel bad. But as soon as we get well, it's like, oh, good. And we forget about it. So we aren't converted in that state because of the situation. It's quite like being in a foxhole. Everyone's no, there's, there are no atheists in a foxhole, the saying goes, because you're under duress. You could die at any moment. So of course I'm going to believe in God. But as soon as the danger is removed, I say, like, all right, I'll go back to my other way of thinking. Many people believe that God is present only when there's a miracle and that he only leads through signs and wonders. And that's not traditionally how it's going to work. I do believe that there are miracles nowadays, but not in what we're thinking about in parting of the waters. I think love between two people is a miracle. Two people that find each other and find lasting love, that's a miracle. A child being born is a miracle. I mean, all kinds of things you look at in this world, I think, are miraculous. And when we believe in the Lord, we see them everywhere. A sunset, morning rise, even the wind, I think, is a miraculous. That can be that strong and that powerful, right? Even though we don't see it. But the Lord says that is not how we're taught. But if you believe that the Lord is there and you believe that he's leading us, you'll see him everywhere. You see flowers coming off the trees today. That's pretty awesome. It's a beautiful thing. 
Nature is a theater that represents the Lord's heavenly kingdom. And when you believe in him and recognize that, you see him speaking to you everywhere. So we're told that we have to create our picture of God by knowing and understanding God. So we have to build our spiritual eyesight. We have to create a vision of the Lord by learning about him. We're told that every truth we learn is like a little mirror that you can add to your picture and you can see more and more the Lord reflected in life. It says, for the divine truths of the word are like mirrors in which the Lord's face is seen. So the more we can learn, the more we can understand who the Lord is, the greater our picture can be and the clearer it can become. Spiritual faith or lasting faith is believing something because it is the truth, because the Lord has taught it and we believe it because he has said so. But what happens, the real thing that makes truth real for us or makes it believable for us is when we live by it. Then we go, oh, I get it. It is true. It is better to be kind and charitable and loving. That is what faith is about. The Lord says, if you know the truth, you're my disciples indeed. Or if you abide in my, sorry, it says, if you abide in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And then you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. People like to just quote, the truth shall make you free and forget the other part, which is if you abide in my word, if you live by these teachings, if you do this stuff, then you're gonna be a disciple and then you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Can't skip that part, <laughs> that part's rather important. So I wanna make it clear that it's okay to doubt. It's all right. In fact, it's good. It's good to doubt. The question to ask ourselves is why Am I so doubtful if I'm in this doubtful state? Am I doing something with that doubt? Am I pursuing understanding or am I just saying, no, nah, I'm just shutting it down and saying, forget it. It doesn't make any sense to me. The prudent doubt have a doubt in which there is affirmation. The foolish have a doubt in which there is negation. So I'll leave you with a couple passages here which talk about our understanding of truth as we as we learn these things and as we come to understand them, then we start to see the Lord. So if anyone asks you, have you ever seen the Lord? You could say, yeah, I've seen the Lord. He speaks to me in his word. I see him, I see his operation. I see him in nature, I see him everywhere. So here's the passage. It is through the understanding to which the eyes correspond that the Lord causes himself to be seen. So we see the Lord in our understanding. A person who leads a life in accordance with the commandments is joined to the Lord, for the commandments teach about life and also impart life, thereby opening the way to heaven and opening one's eyes to see the Lord. They who are in enlightenment when reading the word see the Lord. For each one of the truths from the word is like a mirror in which we see the Lord. And in case I'm giving you the impression that this is all an intellectual exercise, it's not. <laughs> the Lord is living in his word. The Lord is the word. And when we go to him in humility in his word, we have a living relationship and we can see not only with our eyes, but feel with our heart and know that the Lord is there. It depends on our attitude. Amen. We have a moment of prayer and bow our heads. Lord, open our eyes that we may see more clearly. More importantly, open our attitude and our heart that we may have an openness and a willingness and innocence to be led by you. Help us also to pursue understanding and a relationship with you, not just wait for it to fall in our lap, but to find a way to build our knowing and our understanding and our faith in you. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. I invite you to stand for the closing of the word.